Hello, hello everyone. Hi, I'm Tree Franklin. Hi, welcome and thank you for joining us uh, this early hour if you're in the US. Um, later, if not, depending on where you are in the world, welcome to today's Expert Mind Talk. Again, I'm Tree Franklin. It's nice to see everybody. Just take a few minutes, uh, settle in, get a cup of coffee, tea, water, sit back, relax, <laughs> enjoy the show. <laughs> get your notebook if you want to take notes. I'm going to be offering some uh, good golden nuggets for you. If you want to take notes, feel free to you have about a minute or so to go ahead and grab your notebooks, grab a pen, take a breath. If you're just starting your day, just anchor into this morning, this moment, forget about your to-do list, all of the things that you have to do today. If you're ending your day, take a breath, uh, just let go of everything that's happened today. And we're just going to be focused here and present in this moment. I'm curious while we're waiting for people to join, uh, where people are trickling in from, where are you in parts of the world? I'd love to know, write it in the chat. I am personally, right now, I'm in uh, California, Los Angeles, Canada. Yay, hello, Canada. Um, good morning, Philip, hello, people. So, okay, as you come in, feel free to write in the chat where you're calling in from. You know, we usually have people like from India, Indonesia, UK and America, so it's all different parts of the world. Uh, okay, so today we're going to talk about the symbiotic relationship between narcissists and empaths. This is a really hot topic, and New Zealand, hi, hi, Lane. Okay, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, my favorite place, Barbara. That's our favorite place. That's where we go every summer. Um, good morning from France. Hi, Marie Lou. Hello. I love that these are popping up and that they're big enough for me to see without having to wear my glasses. <laughs> so thank you to the Minds Journal, first and foremost, for inviting me back for popping these up. Um, Scotland. Wow, crazy. Nigeria. Oh, my gosh. Pretty Diamond. I love that name. Morning from Northern Mariana Islands, Guam. Wow, very cool. Holy moly. Okay, so we are in all parts of the world. If you're ending your day, this is perfect ending to your day, to spend your time with me. <laughs> it's actually the perfect start to my day to spend my time with you. All right, so I'm assuming you are joining this uh, live call from the point of view of an empath and not the narcissist, because if you're joining from the point of view of the narcissist, that would be an entirely different presentation for you. <laughs> we would be talking about completely different things. So this session is here to help you, the empath, the highly sensitive person, the intuitive, the light worker, um, you know, those who care very, very deeply about people and who are on the other end of that relationship with the narcissist. So before I begin, there are a few key things that I want to address today. Um, we don't really have much time for like a full out masterclass, but I do want to touch on some really important misconceptions that we all see. You know, I see it all the time on social media, blog posts, just people talking about their experiences and hearing the language that's being used in a mass generalized way about narcissism. So I want to clear up some misperceptions. Um, we're going to do that later. I'm just going to define narcissism and um, talk about that a little bit more. Right now, let's talk about the symbiotic relationship. Okay, so as an empath, we all know, I'm assuming you most of you are empaths. I'm an empath and a highly sensitive person. Um, it can be really challenging to have a relationship with anybody, <laughs> let alone have a relationship with a narcissist, because their behavior really clashes with an empath's empathy, with an empath sensitivity and their desire to deeply connect with others. So, oh, also um, before I go on, I wanna make a note that when I refer to an empath here and for the next however long this is gonna take, um, I'm referring to a beginning stages empath. So someone who has not yet learned about their own value and their own power. Someone who doesn't yet understand the true strength of their empathic abilities and their gifts, and someone who doesn't yet know how to manage 
control or otherwise use their empathic gifts for good, right? This is the type of empath that I'm talking about here. There's also the self-realized empath who's done the inner work, developed and they've grown enough to understand their power and they have mastery over their emotions and their energy. And they know how to transmute this energy. This type of empath has no use for narcissists and there's no symbiotic bond that can ever take place. They just, they're just not an energetic match. So they don't attract narcissists and they don't have them in their lives. Maybe before when they were in the beginning stages, they did, but at this point they don't have them in their lives and it's just not an issue or even a thought anymore. There's no fear of meeting someone who might be a narcissist um, because it's just, it's just not that, it's just not a symbiotic bond anymore. A narcissist also doesn't even have any use for this type of an empowered empath because we have nothing that they want. We have nothing to give them, right? Okay, so just so that you know, I'm going to be talking here today about the empath who isn't quite there yet, right? Who isn't quite fully developed. And there's nothing wrong with not being fully developed, that's what life is all about, right? It's about going through stages and our journey of growth and evolution. And we're all there at some point. We all have to go through it and learn and grow. It's a journey for all of us. So whatever I'm going to be talking about, there's no shame or judgment about being where you are or where we are, where anybody is at any given point along that journey. I just wanna make that clear that there's nothing wrong with where you are you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And most of what you experience in this narcissistic relationship, for example, is not your fault. So I just want to make that very, very clear. Okay, so first, let's talk about a symbiotic relationship, just symbiotic relationships in general. Symbiosis basically means living together, right? You can live together harmoniously, or you can live together not harmoniously, the opposite end of not harmoniously. Um, I'm curious if anybody here likes science fiction movies. I am a science fiction geek. I love sci-fi movies. Movies like um, Alien or Venom or TV shows like The Last of Us. If you do, feel free to pop it in the chat. If you're an alien or if you're an alien or a science fiction geek like me, feel free to pop it in the chat. If you're not, no big deal. I'm gonna explain this in a way that you'll also understand. The TV show, The Last of Us is something I've recently been getting into and it's about a fungus. I think it's HBO. It's about a fungus that enters a human body and begins to take over that body. It causes that person to do things that he or she normally would not do. It takes over the person's brain, controls them, and eventually it kills them, and it lives off of their dead body and grows. In the alien movie series, in the alien movie series, like the one with Sigourney Weaver, the alien enters the human body and it takes over the human, lives off of them, feeds off of them, takes from them, take, 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 <laughs> taking and taking and taking and taking and controlling them. And the human inside, the human in there becomes less and less as their life force is literally being sucked dry until there's just nothing left of them. Does anybody feel that way in any of their relationships now or in the past, right? I think we can all relate to some form of another or another of that kind of a relationship where the person's just taking and taking and taking and we end up just feeling completely hollow and empty inside because we're giving and giving and giving. So this type of a symbiotic relationship is called parasitism. It's an actual real thing, right? The symbiotic relationship between a narcissist and an empath can be compared to that of an alien parasite and a human host. Not like in the movie Venom, where you become a superhero. It's more like in The Last of Us, where you become a zombie. And that's no bueno. The narcissist who acts like the alien parasite needs to feed off of the empath's emotions in order to survive. Just as the alien parasite attaches itself to the human host in the movies, and it feeds off of its body and its nutrients, the narcissist attaches themselves to the empath 
and feeds off of their emotional energy. Does that make sense? So just like the human host becomes weaker as the alien parasite feeds off of it, the empath becomes drained and exhausted and weaker as the narcissist continues to take advantage of their kindness, their empathy, and they continue to drain their life force. So in this uh, symbiotic relationship, the narcissist and the empath, they become intertwined with the narcissist relying on the empath for their emotional sustenance. And then the empath, unfortunately, becomes increasingly dependent on the validation and the attention that they receive from the narcissist. Okay, Does, I'm wondering if any of that rings a bell to anybody, even if you're in a relationship not with a narcissist. All right, so I can totally relate. <laughs> even in my previous relationships, not with narcissists. All right. So I want to talk about now why specifically an empath who has not yet learned their own power is susceptible to this type of a symbiotic parasitic relationship and how an empath specifically easily falls prey to narcissistic predators. So an empath is they're typically um, deeply caring we're deeply loving, we feel emotionally really deeply, right? Our emotions are real deep in us and they're very visceral and very real and, and they're important to us. We have a lot of empathy. Empaths want so desperately to connect with other people on a deep, meaningful level. Even if you're an introvert, you wanna connect really deeply um, on a very meaningful level with other people, especially the, our partners, right? That's one of the most important relationships to us. Empaths want to help others and they don't like seeing other people hurt or animals or things, right? They often put other people's needs ahead of their own. And so narcissists, on the other hand, feed off of this because narcissists often put their own needs and desires above other, above other people. So an empath is the perfect person for them. It's the perfect symbiosis because the empath gives their attention and energy freely to others. And the narcissist loves receiving attention and energy. It's perfect symbiosis. When the empath is no longer happy with this and they try to withdraw their attention, the narcissist turns to means of like manipulation, gaslighting, criticizing, making the empath feel like it's their fault. Anything that they can do to try to get back what they had and to continue to get what they want. Also, an empath who doesn't yet know how to manage their energy avoids confrontation like the plague, right? They do everything to try to keep the peace because they don't like or they can't handle the heavy the heaviness of that energy because we tend to absorb other people's energy unwillingly and as a result as a result we try to keep everyone around us peaceful we try to keep peaceful circumstances around us and to keep people happy so that we don't feel or absorb the negative energy of others Unfortunately, a narcissist has very unpredictable mood swings and they can become very easily angered or upset on a whim. And so that makes an empath feel like they're walking on eggshells and they're trying to avoid triggering these outbursts or these criticisms, these, you know, yelling. And if you're at constant, if you're on a, like on a constant hypervigilance and constant alert and in survival mode, constantly walking on eggshells and waiting for the next shoe to drop, what does that mean? It means that the narcissist gets all the attention, even your energy's attention, even when you're not even actively talking to them. They're getting your attention because you're hypervigilant. You're, you're just, just watching and careful. Does that make sense? That's also part of the unhealthy symbiotic bond, right? An empath also has the natural ability to see through a person's behavior and recognize the deeper reason why someone is behaving badly, right? We can see through this because we tend to believe in the good in all people, no matter what. We tend to excuse or dismiss or minimize a person's bad behavior because we can understand that that person is hurting inside, right? 
We understand the, the saying that says hurt people hurt people. We understand that. We may think, oh, this poor person had a rough childhood. You know, their parents abandoned them. Nobody loved them. They didn't feel loved at all. And that's why they are the way they are today. And it's not their fault. They don't know any better. That's how we think about others, right? The empath, <laughs> we want to fix or we want to change, or we try to give that person so much love that maybe they'll finally see the light and maybe that they'll recognize their own worthiness and maybe they will change and become the person that we believe that they are inherently. And we tend to do that a lot because we we really do. We're our intentions are pure. We believe in the good of all people. And we try to help bring that out in other people. Have you ever been with someone who wasn't good enough? And well, they, they weren't good to you most of the time, right? But you saw the good in them and you loved them. And you thought that if you could just show them that they were worthy of love, if you were the one person who could prove to them that they're lovable, that they would finally see it in themselves and that they would finally change. How many of you have ever felt that, right? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, you guys. They don't change, not pure narcissists. They are actually feeding off of this need that you have to help them. That's just part of the unhealthy symbiotic bond. It's, that's all part of it. It all feeds each other. It's your intentions are very well, but it, it's you're only adding more. You're only like creating more strength into that symbiotic bond with them. Okay. So an empath who doesn't yet understand their own worth, we also want to please people around us, right? We're people pleasers. <laughs> we have a huge problem with people pleasing empaths who are not fully in their own power yet. And what do narcissists love? They love to be pleased. And no matter what you do or how much you do, it's never enough for a narcissist. So you're constantly trying to chase that next moment of validation and next moment of pleasure and next moment of um, feedback from them that what you're doing is enough. It's never enough. An empath has too much heart. A narcissist expresses not enough heart, right? It doesn't mean that they don't have heart. It just means that they're not expressing heart. They're not in touch with it. They are feeding off your kindness. They're feeding off your heart. They're feeding off your love. They're feeding off your desire to help them. Whew, that's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Now, first of all, let's dispel the common myth here about narcissism. It's so prevalent and so popular nowadays to call anyone who mistreats you a narcissist, to label them as a narcissist. I talk to people all the time who say that their exes or their current partners are narcissists. And almost everywhere I turn, there are things about gaslighting and narcissism. And just because I want to say this delicately, just because someone is selfish or someone wants all the attention or someone is not thinking about you and thinking more about them or someone is mean to you and cruel to you or abuses you or disrespectful to you or otherwise manipulative, it does not mean that they're a narcissist. Okay. There are real narcissists. And then there are people who have narcissistic personality disorder, which is a clinical diagnosis of a mental health, uh, mental health condition. And then there are people who just have narcissistic traits or tendencies. And there, there are people who in their lives, depending on their stages of their journey, are just, they exhibit narcissistic traits or tendencies in this part of their journey, but eventually they they let go of those narcissistic traits because they're growing they're evolving they're becoming better right they're becoming better humans and so i don't want to put everybody that has ever been mean to you in the category of narcissist because it's not true it's important to remember that 
all of these three are humans too, right? The narcissist, the one with narcissistic personality disorder, and the one who has narcissistic traits. They're not alien parasites. <laughs> they are human with real needs who deserve real love, just like us. And I don't want to make anyone out to be the villain here, like in the movies. I'm merely using that parasitic alien example so that we can um, sort of talk about what a symbiotic relationship is and, and sort of use it as a metaphor to describe the, relation, the symbiotic relationship between an empath and a narcissist, okay? But just because your ex didn't treat you like a king or a queen, it doesn't mean that they're narcissists. And narcissists are not alien parasites. <laughs> So, so if you were with a true narcissist now, or you, or even if you suffered in a relationship with someone who had narcissistic traits, or even someone who abused you, right? I'm not negating or dismissing your pain. I know that it's very real and it's very valid. I just think that we put too much weight on this whole narcissism thing. And it's easier to look at our relationships and blame our exes and just chalk it up to them being a narcissist. Why do we do that? So let's go a little bit deeper. Why do we do that? Why do we like categories ever, everybody as narcissist? So if you have a narcissist and you've been in a relationship, if in your mind, if you label this person as a narcissist and you've been in a relationship with this person who did all these things to you, what are you? Right. You're the parasitic host, right? You're the host, you're the victim. So I would say that the reason why we tend to make the narc, you know, everybody who we've been, who's ever heard us, a narcissist or a villain or a bad person or somebody who's tormented us, the reason we do that is so that we can remain the victim, so that we can maintain our identity of being a victim, this victim identity that we have, right? Being a victim is just another part of that unhealthy symbiotic bond. You always have to have a host and a parasite, right? The parasite always needs a host. The predator always needs a prey. The narcissist always needs a victim or tormentor always needs a victim. And so we are only enabling that unhealthy symbiotic bond when we, you know, nar label narcissist, narcissist, narcissist. They did this to me. They did that to me. They did this to me. And not to negate everything that they did or any bad relationship that you've ever had. But we need to get out of this victim mentality because we are continuing to enable the symbiotic bond. And that's why, for example, long after your relationship with this person has ended, your victim mentality, you keep that bond alive unconsciously. You're not doing this consciously, so it's not your fault. You're not to blame, but you unconsciously keep that bond alive and active in your energy as long as you continue to hold on to that victim identity. Even if that person is long gone, even if they are physically out of your life. Does that make sense? All right. So I want you all to know we were not born to be victims, you guys. We empaths were not born to be victims. We may have fallen into that role, but we were not born to be victims. We were born with immense power. Our empathic gifts allow us to transmute the energy of this dense vibrating planet, not just for ourselves, but for everyone and everything. This is our gift. This is our calling. You are not meant to be a victim. You're a force of light in this world. It's time that all of us, that you, me, all of us step into that identity first and foremost, and we let the other identities become less important. Less important. <sighs> okay. Take a deep breath. I want to see if you guys are still hanging in there with me. What's happening? What do you think? Do you have any questions? We can go into the Q&A section of this. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to pop it in the chat. Any insights? 
uh, I was and am a victim of narcissistic abuse, workplace narcissistic abuse, and one was a grandiose one, the other one being vulnerable one, seeking for consultation now. Yeah, I got to tell you, the workplace um, narcissistic abuse is a tough one. I mean, the personal narcissistic abuse is also a tough one, right? Because you're one on one if you're in a in a personal relationship with someone, and you basically see them every day. The workplace one is also very difficult because that's where we make our living, right? That's what pays your bills, and so it's it's kind of a double whammy. Um, I would say start off with setting boundaries, which is really difficult. I understand it's really difficult to set boundaries. Um, boundaries is your first line of defense, right? It's the it's the um, it's the rock that you put in the path of them trying to trample all over you, right? So it's the boulder. It's the 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 boundary basically that you put in their path to trample all over you, your emotions and your life. So boundaries are key. Boundaries are um, people who do not know their, know their own power and do not believe that they have worth in their own opinion and that they have the right to have a need or to have a desire. Um, people who are not yet in touch with that part of themselves have a very difficult time setting boundaries. People who feel responsible for other people's feelings have a very difficult time setting boundaries because they feel guilt. They see the disappointment in the other person's eyes when they say no. And then they, as an empath, we absorb that disappointment and then we feel disappointed too. And we also, on top of that, we feel guilt because now we feel like we've created this disappointment in the other person. So it's kind of a double whammy for us empaths because we not only feel their disappointment, we also feel our own guilt and then they, it just mixes together. So step one would be to set boundaries there. Um, I actually have a free boundary cheat sheet that I provided. Um, there should be a link either now or later down here that um, it's a three-step method to set boundaries with narcissists. It's a very simple three-step method. Um, it's sort of like an infographic that tells you what to do, exactly what to say word for word and uh, just follow these steps, start there. It's a, it's not a magic trick for you. There's no one magic wand answer where you can just wave and all of those problems will be gone, but start with boundaries, even a small one, even like I need five minutes to myself or you're in a meeting and things are happening. You just, you know, remove yourself. Excuse me, I have to go to the restroom and just remove yourself. Even those little small things add up. Okay, start there. Okay. Also, um, if you have support from other people who are not narcissists, <laughs> other people who can even just listen, therapy is great. I'm all for therapy. I'm all for coaching, um, getting a coach, getting a therapist, finding outside help. BetterHelp is a great app, by the way. Um, I think BetterHelp is a good app for therapy. If you're looking for therapy on your terms, whether it's by the phone or um, chat on the computer or in person, that's a great app to help you find therapy. And then also there are coaches like me that can help you through that as well. And other coaches that are amazing at this sort of stuff. Okay, any other questions, insights? I missed all the stuff that went through. What happens to an empath in a narcissistic relationship? I mean, I was in that kind of relationship and it didn't end well. Now all the time I think how to get back to my previous self. Yeah, so if you are no longer in that relationship, thank goodness it ended, whether it ended well or not. If you were in a narcissistic relationship, the fact that it ended is good. So regardless of how it ends, who cares? It's over. It's good that it's over. So we focus on that moving forward, right? The fact that it's over and now you are free right? You're no longer enmeshed with this narcissist physically. Um, now you are free to go about your merry life and be happy and let them find somebody else, right? Now you're free to go about and start the process of finding yourself. It starts with internal, it starts internally, self-love, self-care. Um, don't mistake self-care for self-love. Self-love, you know, you don't, it's, I see people who, 
get their hair done every month and they take really long baths and they do all of these self-care practices. They buy themselves new clothes regularly and it makes them feel good for five minutes or an hour. And I'm all for self-care. Take that long bubble bath, do your hair, look great, feel good. But I'm not for self-care as a mask underneath the lack of self-love. Does that make sense? So start doing things that um, bring out the self-love in you rather than just masking on the outside and you know taking a, a nice bubble bath and then feeling bad again about yourself after the bubble bath is done, right? So I'm all about self-care, but underneath the self-care, there has to be the deeper, the deeper level of self-love. Start doing things for yourself. Just, you know, sit one morning in silence and ask yourself, what do I want to do today? If it's a weekend or whatever day that you don't have to work, what do I really want to do today? And if you've been involved in a narcissistic relationship for a very long time, chances are you don't even know what you want to do. Chances are you don't even know what you like because everything around your life has revolved around them. Oh, they wanted to eat pancakes in the morning. I guess I like pancakes too because that's what I'm going to eat too, right? So if you've been enmeshed in this symbiotic relationship for a while, it's hard and you've lost that part of yourself, right? You've, you've literally lost it just like the, the parasitic bond. They suck you dry. And so they've sucked you dry and you don't even know who you are. Actually, that's a really good metaphor. Start watering yourself, right? Start watering and nurturing yourself and coming back to life just like you would a plant right? So start doing things. Even if you don't know what you want to do today, remember back to your childhood. If you liked to draw, if you like to paint, if you like to go into the park, if you like to climb trees, things like that, just start small with things that you enjoyed in your childhood when times were really good. And even if you had a bad childhood, there are always moments of good. And there is always inside us that calling, right? So even if you had a bad childhood, you may have loved drawing. So just bring out those little things little by little by little. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? Got a few more minutes. When narcissists are your parents who collide with your ex, another narcissist who uses law to control your life as a parent of your child. Okay, wait. When narcissists are your parents who collide with your ex, another narcissist who uses law to control your life as a parent of your child. I'm not understanding that question. <laughs> Sorry, Kate, can you ask it in another way? Um, are you saying that, that your parents were narcissists, your ex is a narcissist? and they are controlling you? I'm not sure. Can you ask it in a different way? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Uh, okay, another question. Have attachment problem even if couldn't be able to meet face-to-face -face till now? Again, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, another question. Narcissists, NPD, and narcissistic traits, how do we distinguish between these? Um, so the I would say, like, when I was growing up, I had narcissistic traits. I would say most teenagers, <laughs> I'm sorry to say this, most teenagers, especially in the Western world, we have narcissistic person or narcissistic narcissistic tendencies and traits because teenagers, especially now, all their photos, oh, let's take a selfie, let's take a selfie, and all these different poses, it's all about them. And they're not able, but I'm not saying all teenagers, let's just say most westernized teenagers in our entitled society are me included when I was a teenager, all about themselves right? They're, they don't recognize how much the parents or their caretakers do for them. They want more and more and more and more. And parents give and give and give. And it's never enough for teenagers, 
right? They just go through this phase where they're un, they're not only ungrateful, but they're actually like anti-parent. You know, my mom or my dad is so dumb, they don't understand anything, right? They go through this phase where they just sort of lose their brains. And so that's narcissistic trait. That's a narcissistic tendency that they grow out of. Most teenagers grow out of this because they learn, right? They grow and evolve. And so you can sort of tell because they go in and out of it, right? They don't always they don't always like exhibit the narcissistic traits. Sometimes they can be very loving and they can be very and, and meaningful loving, not fake loving, but they can be very authentic and genuine with their love. And they have moments of pure genius, like pure goodness, right? And you can see all of this and that you know that that's who they really are. A narcissist um, is not like that. They, A narcissist is is a real human being, but a narcissist and a narcissist and a person who has narcissistic traits or tendencies, it's it's on a whole other level. Does that make sense? Person who has narcissistic um, personality disorder is very capable of empathy. They just don't know it. And for us empaths, we're like, how can you not have empathy? How can how can people actually take classes to have more empathy? And we empaths are like, what? You have to take classes to have more empathy or take some of mine. I have too much, right? We just don't understand that because it so comes so naturally to us, but not everybody. And so I do know quite a few people who have narcissistic personality disorder, NPD, who actually take classes for empathy. And a lot of leaders who are not naturally empathetic have not learned that as either a natural way of their being or learned that growing up has not been taught that, they take classes to learn how to empathize with other people, right? Um, so people who have narcissistic personality disorder, it's a mental health condition, right? It's clinically diagnosed. It's almost like having depression, for example, right? Or bipolarism. It's a, it's a clinically diagnosed thing that can be rid of, that can be aided and can be helped, I honestly have not done enough research about true narcissists to know, although to know whether they can fully change, like fully, right? I don't know. I don't know if it's in their biology or in their makeup. Um, I do know that they lack mirror new uh, mirror neurons, right? So a mirror neuron is basically, you know, for us empaths, you might see somebody cry and instantly you start crying. <laughs> it's just we have a lot of mirror neurons in us that are very, very active. And so we mirror the other person's emotions. So I see you cry and I feel you. And then I cry too. I see a coffee commercial, Folgers coffee commercial or a Christmas commercial about families coming home together or like soldier commercials where they surprise their mom and dad and they came home off duty for the holidays. Right. And then I'm like bawling. I'm crying because I have all these I have so much empathy and I have all these mirror neurons um, that are mirroring your emotion. Narcissists do not, and sociopaths do not have any mirror neurons or very little mirror neurons. That's that's one like massive difference between us. I hope that answered your question. Anything else? We are coming up upon the time to end. So let's just take a couple more. Uh, Barbara had a narcissistic boss I put up with for a year and a half. It was so hard as an empath to tell him how I felt. But at the end, I could not take any more. I lost a good salary, but I showed him who I really was. Yes, Barbara, yes. That's amazing. Congratulations, because yes, I know how difficult it is to lose a very good salary. But in losing that and standing up for yourself, you gained yourself. Like, that's huge. I'm so proud of you. That's amazing. That is like everything, right? A lot of us are willing to lose pieces of ourselves to gain things like good salaries, things like validation from other people who we don't really need to be focusing on giving us validation and things like that. So so proud of you. So proud of you. All right. Good for you. Anything else? Uh, let's do one more. 
Um, how do we recover from the narcissist that destroyed you? Yeah, I'm sorry you experienced that. The fact that you are still here, the fact that you are on this call and okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to end this with this example. So, you know, in those alien movies, you have in the beginning, two people, they really, really love each other, right? Let's say they're partners, right? Or a father and a son or a mother and a whatever, whatever, a child and their parent, right? Let's say two people who in the beginning of the relationship, they build up this movie, everything is happy and they love each other. And then they meet aliens <laughs> and then aliens come down to earth. And then the alien takes over the, uh, the child's body, right? Or no, let's say here's the child and here's the, uh, the parent, the alien takes over the parent's body and the parent, again, with our, our um, parasitic <laughs> bond here, the parent is now under the control of the narcissist or really the alien. The parent is under the control of the alien and um, the child runs away and throughout the whole movie. And then the very end, this is the part of the climax of the movie, right? Every movie sort of goes through this. At the very end, at the climax, the parent and the child comes face to face. And the parent, who's ruled by the alien, is about to consume the child, is about to kill the child and eat the child. And the child's like, Mom, I know you're in there. I know you're in there. You're still in there, Mom. And the, the parent is like, ah, the mom's coming at him about to eat the child and the and the child's like mom mom i know you're in there come on fight for me mom and then the um mother with that little glimmer of life left in her that the alien did not destroy overcomes the alien and does whatever she does and fights the alien and then the and you know the alien jumps out of her body because she's no longer a symbiotic host, there's no longer symbiosis. And then the mom and the child hug each other and they love each other and then it was a happy ending. So I wanna say to you, not to diminish what you went through, but you and that life in you as the mother, because you are here on this call, in this live talk right now, because you took time out of your day, there is life left in you. You have not been destroyed. You may feel like you've been destroyed and I don't know your specific circumstance, but maybe you've lost everything in your life. Um, houses, you know, everything, your job because of this narcissist, but you are still left. There's a glimmer and a fire still inside you. So you have not been destroyed. It may feel like that, but it's still there. You are still there. I just want you to remember this analogy every time you think that you've been destroyed and beaten. That's not true. Our feelings may feel that way. Definitely not true. You're still there. You are still a force of light in this world and you can still shine very brightly and put all of that behind you. So we start again by going back to the um, example that I gave to the other person who asked the question. We start with, start with you. All of that is gone, right? You are no longer a victim. You are no longer identifying with that victim mentality. And we can no longer identify with the idea that we were destroyed, no matter how low we've gotten. You are here. And that means a lot. That means that there's still a fighter inside you. That means that there's so much strength inside you. Don't ever, and I, I can feel it and I can see it. So don't ever doubt that. There's already this fighter inside you that can fully emerge, water that dry part of you, water it, nurture it, watch this seed regrow and nourish and flourish, right? Okay, thank you for joining me. I hope that helped. Uh, it starts small, very small, it takes a long time. I understand that there's a lot of pain and a lot of hurt and it's really difficult process to un uncover all those layers. Um, you guys are all welcome to reach out to me. You can find me at treefranklin.com. But I also want to give you more than that, a boundary cheat sheet um, at treefranklin.com. Franklin is spelled with a Y. Thank you, Minds Journal, for putting that up there. Uh, treefranklin.com. Uh, go to treefranklin.com slash boundaries cheat sheet. 
and you'll find a infographic and it's just a short little quick thing that'll help you on the way, on your path towards being free and this force of light that I know you are. Thank you guys for joining. I appreciate you. Namaste.